right. Well, Revelation, <laughs> Revelation 13. We're going to continue with something. I wonder how I get that thing off. I got a dang dub on. There it is. Okay. Revelation 13. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to center in on the one verse, but uh, the chapter is about the beast. It's about time. Verse 5. It's about eight, the name whose names are not written in the book of life. Uh, great wonders, verse 13. And then the mark of the beast from uh, 16 and 17. Of course, 15 is about the image of the beast coming alive. But let's key up on verse uh, 17. At that no man might buy or sell, save that he hath the mark had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name okay here is wisdom let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man and his name is 600 three score and six and a man is what we're going to key up on we're going to key up on some things on that so uh um we're going to check out the word a man, it refers to a human being. So this mark is in relationship to a human being. And we're going to see who it is in a minute. But he's it's the beast. And go to 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. And I do not claim to have any lock on Revelation. Revelation's a sealed book. It is for the last time, obviously, for uh, in Revelation 13, the mention of time there is, um, hang on, I'll give it to you. Uh, in Revelation 13, 5, it's for 42 months. Uh, you go back to chapter 12, it's a time, times and half time, which would be 42 months. And that'd be uh, uh, one year, plus two years, plus half a year, which would be three and a half years, and that's 42 months on a 30-day month. So in 1 Timothy 6, I want to, we're going to talk about a man or the word man in the scriptures. All right, in 1 Timothy 6, 16, who only, well, let's go back to 15, which in his times he shall show who is blessed, the blessed and only potentate, king of king and lord of lords who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light, which no man, again, that's human being, can approach unto whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So that's a human being. Uh, no human being has, uh, in, in accordance to the verse, he said, no man can approach unto it, and no man has seen nor can see. So he's give you the truth and the fact of what a human being is not able to do. And of course, a lot of people say they died and went to the light and came back. No, they didn't see the light, nor did they go to the light because the verse says approach or see. So we got that. Now turn to John chapter one. In John chapter one, Verse 18, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten son, which is uh, in the bosom of the father, he had declared him, okay? Now, uh, Jesus Christ uh, is recorded as the son of man and the son of God. And we're gonna look at these things, but I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. All right, in Matthew 16, Jesus questions his disciples. And uh, he said in verse 13, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Uh, and the son of man, <clears throat> 
is a human being. And in other words, that's what it means, a human being. Jesus is a human being in the presence of them. Uh, in John, he, uh, he came unto his own, his own received him not. Uh, we find that uh, he came uh, born of a woman. Uh, look in Galatians, or made of a woman. Galatians chapter 4. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Now, I want you to remember that no man, no human can approach unto nor see what he said in 1 Timothy 6. I'll go back and read it to you one more time. Verse 16, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now that's not going to change. And if something happens different, then this could be a lie, but it isn't. There's no lie in the Bible. So we've got to search this thing out and see how this works. Now, Galatians chapter four, verse four. When Jesus left the Father, and uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And we find that <clears throat> there are three that dwell in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Jesus, as the name, is not known until Matthew. But the Lord has always been with his Lord. Now, God Almighty is the Father, and that is not ever going to change, and he is the Lord. Jesus, who we know as the Lord in the Old Testament, somebody says, well, the Lord of the Old Testament is not Jesus. Turn to Zechariah, and this is where the Jehovah Witnesses are liars. They say that the Lord of the Old is not Jesus of the New. Okay, uh, I had a man tell me one time, there's nowhere in the Bible that God ever calls Jesus God. And that's a lie also, and I'll show you. Zechariah chapter 12, verse nine, uh, 10. And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. Okay, now before I say it, in verse, go back to, one, Zechariah 12, 1. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord. So with the Lord is talking, okay? In Zechariah chapter uh, 12, 10, I, the Lord, will pour out upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. There, No one ever pierced God the Father. They pierced God the Son. And we know him as the Son of God, but we'll get into that in just a minute. He said, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Then the Lord that's speaking here is the Lord Jesus Christ because they pierced him. There's no doubt. Uh, they pierced him with uh, three nails and obviously the sword and so forth. And he says, whom uh, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and shall mourn for me as one mourneth for his own son and they shall uh, be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness of his firstborn and look in Hebrews chapter 1 in Hebrews 1 now you understand the old witnesses are liars they said they're Jehovah's witness and they worship the Lord Jehovah. You can't worship the Lord Jehovah if you don't worship, worship him through the Lord Jesus Christ. The uh, whosoever I, verily, verily I send you, whosoever I send, you receive him, you receive me. And if you receive me, you receive him that sent me. You cannot go to God the Father and worship him without going through Jesus Christ. That's very clear. Hebrews chapter one, look with me in uh, chapter one, verse uh Seven and uh, uh, well, I have to cut in here. Verse five For unto which of the angels saith he at any time, that's God, verse one, God, 
Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be unto, uh, be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the firstborn into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers uh, of uh, ministers a flame of fire. But unto the son, he saith, thy throne, O God, <laughs> thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness in thy, is the scepter of thy kingdom. Uh, the Lord, God Almighty, called the Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> God, he said, O God. So not only is he the Lord of the old, he is God. Turn to First John. I know you know these. In First John chapter 5. Uh, three, I apologize. First John chapter three. Uh, I apologize too. I got some dust in my nose. First John chapter five, verse seven. For a three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Okay, they're one. Then if Lord Jehovah, which is one of His names, He's known by, is the Lord. Man, so I apologize. Then Jesus Christ, who is O God, and these three are one, is the Lord of the new. They will look on him whom they pierce. So you got your old witnesses are in a lie. They're in a just a flat out lie. And folks, you can't worship in a lie. The Bible says uh, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. <laughs> Man, I got it. I do apologize. All right, now go back to John chapter 1. All right, in John chapter 1, look with me in verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. All right, no man. All right, again, that's a human being. No man has seen God at any time. Then did Jesus as a human being see God? That's the question you ask it. I mean, you're reading along there and you see no man has seen God and Jesus is the son of man and on and on. Well, now let's look, go back here in uh, John chapter 11. Uh, John chapter one, verse 11. He came unto his own. All right, now go back to Galatians chapter 4. And there's a verse, and I, it escapes my mind right now, but uh, I'm sure it's in John. I just have to find it. Uh, give me a second. Uh, anyway, I'll go back in a minute. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, that's the prophecy of Isaiah 7, 14, which the Lord God gave unto Ahaz, prophecy of the virgin birth. Okay? Now, the virgin birth is where Jesus, as we know him in Matthew chapter 1, as we also know him as God, the Son of God, the Son of Man, <clears throat> the Holy One, the Only Begotten. I mean, there's lots of things we know Him by. It says, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman. Well, He sent Him then. He's with Him. Okay? He sent Him forth, and it was to do a ministry. All right? John chapter 1, one more time. In John chapter 1, Verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Okay, verse 14, and the word was made flesh. All right, you read in 1 John chapter 5, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Lord, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. All right, now the word was made flesh. All right, the word being made flesh is going to live the word. I don't know how to say this. 
I was thinking about something the other day of how secure a believer is. I mean, the Bible says we're to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct our paths. Our heart is deceitful. It's deceitful above all things and desperately weak. Jeremiah. So in trusting the Lord with all my heart, I quit thinking or saying I believe and I go to what it says. Okay? Now, what it says is not going to change. God's word is so secure that he magnified his word above his name. And I want you, you know, I, I'm a failure as a human being myself to get over to you. In this trust, nothing can mess up what God is going to do. Now, I, I want you to think about that. There's a movie with Matt Damon that came out, the uh, enforcement agency or something, or the uh, some kind of agency where their angels are all organizing everything according to the book. They will not say Bible. They say book. And then they talk about rewriting the book and then all that. But everything has to fall in place and there's no ripples and all that. And I told Kathy, I said, there they are making a mockery of God himself, because uh, the, the idea is when God inspired the Bible, it's on his foreknowledge to be written down what he knows is going to happen. Uh, go back with me to Romans 15. I don't know if I can get this over to you, but a human being cannot do this. A human being can't see past his nose. What's going to happen to him in the next second, he doesn't know. Many a person dies in car wrecks and other things, instantaneous. They said, oh, he, he died instantaneous, instantly. Then he didn't see it. It's like people go to uh, soothsayers and palm readers. Well, why don't they read their own? if they're so good. They don't know. So you go to a palm reader, she tells you you're going to have this and this and this. She gets in the car, gets a car wreck. She didn't read her own future. No, because she can't. No human can see his future unless he reads God's word. See, that's the problem with the world. The world is going on what they hope they can change the world into, the green that came out years ago, and now the electric age to where they're trying to get rid of the fossil fuels and all that to see that they can, they can make the world better. <clears throat> the world is not going to get better. It is an evil world. And <clears throat> they try to make it <clears throat> mankind <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of billions of years old. Man's about 6,000 years old right now because in what he's done in the 6,000 years has been incredible to the earth. And what he's done to mankind has been horrible. Wars and things happening and people killing from the sin entering the world, of Romans 5, 12. The once that Cain, <clears throat> Cain thing begins and he kills his brother. From that point on, it's going to be killing until now. And people think that if they do away with guns, they'll clear up the matter. Well, there's still rocks and stones and knives. You're not going to change sin. Sin is here, and it will be unless something happens. And, of course, we know by the revelation that one day he'll burn the heaven and earth and cleanse it. But that's up to God. But does he know that's going to happen? He said so. Did he know your time? Ecclesiastes said there's a time. The time to be born. Did he know your birthday? Yes, he did. Did he know the hairs on your head? Yes, he did. Does he hear all your prayers? Uh, on that movie, we were watching the uh it said, Well, we can't we can't we can't handle everybody. See what they did, they restricted God that man had to help God because he can't handle it all. God don't have to handle it all, he can handle it all. Not only does he can, he does handle it all. And he is so awesome. I mean, 
it's beyond our thinking. It's beyond our thinking how powerful God is. We try to restrict him in our prayers because we say, well, if you want to or if you could. No, there is no restriction. God owns it all, knows it all, and nothing, nothing is going to come in the way of God's plan. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. His purpose cannot be disrupted. The, Satan did not disrupt God's purpose with, with Jesus when he killed him on the cross. No way, no how. Why? Because he had us in mind before the foundation of the world, and you've got to get that in your trust. Before the foundation of the world, God saw you. Thus, all things work together for good to you if you're the call. If you're not, trust him today. Trust him. He knew how to save you. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Psalm 3, verse 8. Salvation belongs unto the Lord. Hey, Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture. And he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to Scripture. Not only do I trust that for my salvation, I trust that for your salvation. I trust it enough to preach it, to constantly go over it with you, because it is your salvation and it is your comfort. If you get tired of hearing the gospel from me, they might be something wrong. You shouldn't. <clears throat> you shouldn't be uh, upset with that at all. Uh, the the idea of being saved should be the most wonderful thing in your world. The most important thing to me in the world is salvation. Then my, my wife and then my children, whatever. My Bible studies are right at the top. The people I have in Bible studies, are they mean everything to me. I would do anything for you. <laughs> is that your attitude towards the Bible, but towards God, but towards, towards the people? You're so supposed to prefer the people that are saved, prefer one another. Uh, is the people in the Bible study more important than anything else? Or is that just something that happens? You see, you have to examine yourself in these things. Uh, in the faith, in uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself whether you're in the faith. In the faith, is there's a responsibility in there that's not a have to, it's a should. And you should prefer one another. You should want to have fellowship. You should want to study. And I thank God for every one of you that tune in. I thank God for everybody that comes to class. I thank God for everybody that's invited me to class or lets me in their home or anything else. I, I, I thank God for that. Why? Because that's a thing of God. But go back to Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things written before time are written for our learning. Why would he say that if the Bible isn't true? Why would God write things that are a lie? Why would God not be able to write things if he's not God? The Bible says in 1 Peter that Christ, who we didn't know in the Old Testament except as the Lord, <clears throat> Christ was in, the Spirit of Christ was in them as the prophets wrote it down. So as we read the prophets with the mind of Christ, the first Corinthians chapter two, verse end of the verse, end of the chapter. Then we uh, we are reading the mind of Christ, the the spirit of Christ in the in the prophets and whatever. And, and bless your soul, the spirit of Christ wrote of himself in, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Then he inspired Paul to write Galatians chapter 4, when the fullness of the time was come, the prophecy time of Isaiah 7, 14, which no one in the Bible knew when that would come. It's there, it's coming, no one knows when it is. It, it's just like the catching out of the church, the body of Christ. We know it's coming, we just don't know when it's coming, but we know why it's coming. 
How do we know why? God didn't give us the time, but he gave us the why. Well, the why is Ephesians chapter four. In Ephesians chapter four, he says in verse uh, 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Well, then if we come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of a stature of the fullness of Christ, that's everyone is in the body. When everyone's in the body, every human being, every man is in the body. And I'm not talking about uh, the opposite of, of man, woman. I'm talking about mankind, human beings. Men and women are human beings. Uh, some women don't think men are. We are. Human beings, all human beings, until when all the human beings that are coming into the body who God knew, the call, when they all come into the body, then the unity of the faith has been established. The stature of the fullness of, the, of Christ, the perfect man, that man who has not been appointed under wrath, that man who will not see the tribulation will leave. It's like a load them up, a head them up, move them out, Everybody aboard, all aboard, we're gone. Okay. Well, <clears throat> as we read Romans 15, 4, what sort of thing, for what sort of things are written aforetime, written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. The hope is it, it's not seen. Uh, look in Hebrews chapter 11. See, Paul said he was concerned with our faith in 1 Corinthians chapter, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Well, the power of God is obviously the gospel of Christ, and the power of God to foresee, the power of God to not let anything, nothing can bother what God saw. Now, that's what gives me hope. I don't have to worry about it. Nothing can mess up what God said because he magnified his word above his name and nothing will change it. Now they can translate it. They can change it. They can preach and change it by their words, their wisdom of words they call, which is foolishness of God. But the word of God will not change, folks. That's what you need to understand. That's what you need to put your sight on. Uh, Hebrews 11, 1. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen is your faith. The evidence of things that you cannot be changed is his faith. The faith of the God of the Old Testament. Go to Romans chapter 3 and watch. Romans 3, 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God brought a faith in. He brought his faith in. And nothing can make it of none effect. That's what you have to trust. You have to trust that a man, a human being, who was the son of God, Referred to as the Son of Man. Turn to Matthew 16. In Matthew 16. Jesus as the Son of Man lived it for us. Look in uh, Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Okay. He refers to himself <clears throat> as the Son of Man. And that Son of Man, this is what the Son of Man did, 1 Corinthians 15. All right. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, declare, uh, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you received and where you stand, by which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, 
and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to Scripture. Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of Christ. That's what saved you. And Jesus Christ, which is the Word, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He lived according to his Word. You know, you hear people say, I, I give you my Word. And then sometimes they break it. That's because they're human beings that are not the Son of God, the Son of Men, the Son of Man. Jesus Christ gave his Word, did his Word, fulfilled his Word, and will never leave his word, nor will he ever change his word. God cannot lie. God lying would be changing his word. God does not lie, cannot lie. And by the way, if God, go to Titus with me. Uh, Titus chapter one. And this is a quite a statement. He said, Verse 2, Titus 1, 2. In the hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. He cannot lie. Why? Because he magnified his word above his name. If God can lie, if God does lie, we have no hope. He cannot lie. Look in Romans 8. In Romans chapter 8, the clearest, probably chapters on eternal security. Romans 8, 31. What should we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? There's nobody be against you. If God for you, nobody be against you. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And the reason he could deliver him, hold this just a minute, go to Galatians. I, I wish, I know as a human being, I'm a failure to get this over to you. I wish that I could give you the comfort it gives me of the assurance of God not lying and his ability. In Galatians chapter 1, so I just read it to you, Galatians 1, 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. I'm not going to try to change the world. I'll let Jesus deliver me from it. There are words that are associated with Paul that are not associated with Peter. Paul says we're crucified with Christ. Paul says the old man has been crucified. We're dead to sin. Oh, I mean, there are just things like into that. But if I could just, just bring it to you, you know what they say, bring it to me. That trusting the Lord is great comfort. Because we are the walking faith. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Folks, that is preaching, but that is also you. Faith cometh by hearing. If you truly believe what it says, then you tell it. Lord, I have believed, therefore have I spoken. Uh, the men came up to Jesus and they said, Lord, we believe, help us with our unbelief. The unbelief, the help of the unbelief is what Ephesians chapter 4, he gave some pastors and teachers. The teaching and preaching of the of the word of God in its truth and verity. And Paul said, I speak to you in truth and in verity. Is that the faith that I have in the book should be related to you Faith to faith. If I didn't believe, what good would it be to you? But I do. And I pray to God that I be brave in situations where the flesh wants to be scared. I pray that the faith of this Bible always come through my mouth. And that you, with receiving ears, hear of the faith of God, which is the faith of Christ. 
and the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ, might come into your ears and you understand. And as I read Romans 15, for all things written a four time written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. We look for it, but we look for it with a confidence of Romans 8, 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elected is God that justify? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make an intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, neck in his peril or sword? As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep of the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loves us. For I'm persuaded. And if Paul can persuade me, I want to persuade you. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And you understand, if I do not have Paul's persuasion, which is written down, then I'm going to have to go on my heart and feelings, and it will not work. My heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I don't trust my heart. I trust in my heart, all my heart, what this says. And if it says it, it's good for you. And if you trust the Lord, now look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom you also trust, have you come to that point in your life where you had to trust? Uh, Mary Beth and Kathy and I was talking about the other night. Uh, you take a boxing match, and you've got two well-groomed physical specimens that are going to fight. And they both are bragging. They're both exhibiting their muscles and their chest. And, and they have that look of, I'm going to whip you on their face. And they're proud and they're haughty. But when the fight's over, if it's a winner or a knockout or a beatdown, you still got the one being interviewed by the press that won, and he's haughty and he's high minded. Look at me. But the other one's in the dressing room, beat down, black eyes, bruised, teeth knocked out. And he ain't got nothing to say because he's been broken. Maybe you need to be broken. Maybe you need to come to a point in your life where you can't do it, even though you thought you could. Even maybe you got an election, intellectual salvation. And you were so glad about grace, you could pull out of the church. You didn't have to go to church anymore. And you didn't have to give your tithes and love offerings. And you didn't have to uh, dress up in the morning and go anywhere. Oh, you can even get on Zoom. You don't have to do anything but you're still haughty and high-minded. The Lord said he is nigh them of a broken heart and saveth those of a contrite spirit. It's when you can't do anything anymore. You see, you'll never get saved unless you first get lost. You have to be lost to need somebody to show you the way. Acts chapter 16, the woman of divination said, these are the men of the most high God that will show us the way of salvation. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to scripture, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. A man, a human, just delivered that to you. That man got it from another man who got it from another man who got it from another man who got it from Paul, a man, who got it from 
the Son of God, who was a man, lived his life without sin, knowing sin, tasted death for all men, went into hell, and arose victoriously, victory in that his faith satisfied his Father God for us. Maybe you've never been broken. Never, maybe you've never had a contrast spirit. Maybe you're just proud. And, you know, oh, I'm in Bible class, and I don't, I don't do that religion anymore. I don't like it. Well, there's things you didn't like about religion, but you still sometimes talk it, think it, still wonder about the buildings and the people in the buildings. You wonder how could all these people around you be lost because they don't know they are. If our gospel be hid, it's hid. They were lost. And the gospel of Christ takes all your ability to save you, takes it away from you, and puts it in the faith of another man who was more faithful than you. He was better than you. He was nicer than you. Who willingly, knowing what you are, what he saw you as living, he saw your life. Romans 8 said he did. Turn to Romans 8 again. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 8, verse 27, uh, uh, 29. And we know uh, for whom he did foreknow. Well, you, what do you think he's saying about you in foreknowledge before the foundation world? Is he seeing you living a good life? Is he seeing you doing right? Is he seeing <clears throat> what you say you are, considering we're all actors? We're all liars. Let God be true and every man a liar. Seeing all that about you, seeing what you did and didn't do, why you didn't do certain things because you didn't want to get caught, but if you do, you wouldn't get caught, you'd do it. Seeing all the time that sin that dwells in you comes up, flares up and does things wrong, but it hides it so that nobody knows it about you. And you look really nice, you act nice, but inward there, is like the cemetery. Why did sepulchers, but on the inside is death? Death is inside that. You can pretty up a grave where your mom and dad or your children or anybody uh, in the grave, pretty it up, mow it, put flowers on it, and decorate the stone, keep the moss off of it. But inside is death. That's the human. The human being, he is outwardly looks pretty good sometimes. And you always identify the fact, you look at those people that really don't hide what they are, what they call it, coming out of the closet. <clears throat> you look at that and you see people that you think are dirty and, and uh, sinful and doing things that you wouldn't think about doing. And they got the same death in them that you do. I told you the story about my sister. My sister... Didn't tell me this for a little while. And then she finally told me. My sister was a good person. When I say, I'm not talking about Romans 3, 10, 11, 12. She was uh, married the second man she ever uh, dated. And uh, I, I no doubt have, no, I, I don't have any doubts that my sister was a virgin. She married, they got married. They've been married 50 something years, 60 something years. I can't remember. And she has Alzheimer's now. My sister never cursed. My, my sister never really talked about anybody. I, I, I don't know anything. I, I just don't honestly don't know anything to say about my sister, except she lived a good life. And right after I trusted the Lord, May the 17th, 1984, when I was broken, I couldn't do it anymore. I tried. I tried by cutting my ponytail and quit drinking, going to work for Brother Moore, I tried to get saved. You can't get saved, folks. You have to trust that you are. And it, May 17, 1984, at 9.20 on I-10, I saw 
my helplessness and I trusted the Lord. Well, my sister heard of that. I, I think I told her or it got wind to her. And she, the greatest thing about it was that year I took her to a Fort Walton Beach conference. So she'd never been. And I went up to Arkansas and got her and took her to Fort Walton Beach. And she saw a lot of old friends. She knew a lot of people I do. And she told someone there, she didn't tell me. She said, if there was anybody, she said, I heard testimony of my brother. And she said, if there was anybody that needed to be saved, it was my brother. She knew me. She knew my life. I was, uh, would have been hard for you guys to live with. Uh, I'm, I'm not a good guy. I did a lot of things. And I was into a lot of things. But God saved me. He foreknew all that. He, he knew everything about Jerry Sanders. Jerry Sanders wasn't hiding anything from him. Still ain't. Got it all recorded. That's all written down. That's my comfort. It's written down. It's nothing hid. <clears throat> my name's just not in there in the sense that you're going to read Jerry Sanders. I know that in me there dwells no good. They're on seven. That's me to read and see. Comfort. And she said, if there's anybody that needs to be saved, it's my brother. And it hit her like a rock. Oh my God. We have the same daddy and the same nature. And even though my whited sepulcher is kept clean and looks good, inside of me is death, sin. And she trusted the Lord. And later on, she told me about that. And it made my heart rejoice. For yea, my sister, with all timers, will still go to the Lord. If my day's in, I go to the Lord. As a human being, I want to go out alive. There's that pride and that vanity. I want to be one of them to go out alive. No, that's just the fear of the flesh, not wanting to die. But going out alive or going to sleep, same thing, You're going to the same Lord. And the comfort of the scripture is that uh, those that are asleep in Christ are with the Lord. He wakes them up, and brings them down. We which are alive and remain, if that's what we are, we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. First Thessalonians chapter four, and God cannot lie. Then the reality is that's coming someday. Why is it coming? Because the stature of the Christ the fullness of him that filleth all in all will happen. There is one last man somewhere, someday, that's going to trust the Lord, and we're going to leave this earth because our Lord and Savior delivered us from this present evil world. And we will not be concerned with that mark of the beast because we go out three and a half years before it we go out before the tribulation even starts. And that's what's cool. I can read that and I can see that. Now, I want you to turn with me to John chapter three. Probably spent most of my time talking about what I did, but John chapter three, verse one. There was a man of the Pharisees. This man here is a human being. Now, I'll give you the word, it's anthropoise. Anthropod, I mean, you know, anthropos is a, is a uh, scientific name, I guess you'd call it. But in, in that word, it's human being. It's just a human being. Uh, we're all human beings. We're born of our dad. We're all born. We're not created in the flesh. We're born. Now, we're created in the spirit. That's another thing altogether. But now in John 3, uh, Verse one, a man. He's a human being. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. So he's physically living. He's a man. Verse two, the same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man, that word man there has to do with the none. There's, there's none. It's like he's saying in Romans 3, 10, 11, 12, there is none. Nobody could have done this. Nobody can do what you're doing except 
God be with him. Okay? So these things that people are doing today, calling them signs and wonders and miracles, they're not of God. They're called, uh, uh, in Second Thessalonians, lying signs and wonders. Okay? So no man, none can do these miracles which thou doest except God with thee. All right, verse three, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man. Now, this is an entirely new man here. This word means a certain one. Just a certain one is different than anybody else. Well, we know that Jesus is different than anyone else. Not the fact that he is a human being. He's the son of man. But as the son of God, he's different. He does not have the blood of Adam in him. He has the blood of God, according to Acts chapter 20. And this man, certain one, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God involves light. And remember, in 1 Timothy 6, no man, human, has seen or approached unto. Said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Hmm. So people use born again as salvation. It doesn't ever say that in this chapter. It says see, but that is not. Verse 4, Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man, and that man right there is a human being again. And he's going, how can a human being be born when he's old. Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? He's thinking like a human being thinks. You understand, you cannot think like a human being when it comes to God. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You have to think of him spiritually, and that's the mind of Christ. A human being can't think it. And I try to emphasize that to people over and over again. A human cannot think like God. Man, human being is, is, is man's wisdom. You have to turn over everything you thought or knew and trust the word of God itself because it's spiritual. Uh, First Corinthians said, uh, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I think Jan brought that up at the conference that I corrected him on that. I didn't do it in meanness. I just, he was saying it wrong and I did it. All right, now verse uh, four, uh, five. Jesus says, verily, verily I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the capital S, spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. See or enter. Born again. What man? Verse five. He said, I said to you, except a man, a certain man. And that's him. Well, he was born of the flesh, but he's born of the spirit. Look back with me in Matthew chapter three. In Matthew chapter three. Verse 15, Jesus answered, that's John the Baptist, said unto him, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered it. And Jesus, when he was baptized, water, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God, capital S, Spirit of God descend like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, and that seal of John 6, 28. He sealed him. Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, verse 13, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, the human, am? And, he, and they said, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, other Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art, are you listening? The Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood 
hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, what makes Jesus proved as the Son of God? Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated on the gospel of God, which he had promised to for by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God, with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. The absolute proof that Jesus was the Son of God was the resurrection. When God raised his only begotten Son, he proved to the world, this is my Son. I was well pleased with him on earth. Now you know I'm totally well pleased with him. Now, if he's pleased with the Son of God, Look with me in Ephesians. In Ephesians. And again, my failure, I wished I could relate to you my thinking of the scriptures to where your trust would never waver. Nothing can disrupt, disturb, or tear up the work of God. Nothing can mess up his operation. We're complete. The operation of God completed it. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. His dear son that he raised from the dead got us forgiveness. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Jesus Christ's faith was enough to satisfy God. And he was the sacrifice that God accepted. There's no sacrifice that you and I could have given that God that would, would have made us accepted in the Father. No sacrifice gave in the Old Testament would, sacrifice, would satisfy God in eternal life. Because the blood of animals and bulls and goats would not, it, it only covered the sin. But the one time sacrifice that Jesus made was enough for God for every time in the Bible that men had done what God said. God will not forsake men that did what he said. Did they clear up their own sins? No. Did we clear up our own sins? No. Can we confess our sins enough to clean them up? No. Can we stop our death? No. We can trust a living God who is the only power that availeth over everything that says he cannot lie, that established us in his word, that we're holy and without blame. Look at Ephesians 1. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according to chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Nothing's going to mess with it. Nothing can take it away from you. Trust him. He established it by his word, and he magnified his word above his name before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And that's the love of Christ, the love of God, the love of mankind, human beings. I started this and that man, that human being, the number of that man was Judas Iscariot. We're not going to get to that today. I apologize. But what I want you to understand is Jesus being born again is fulfilling all righteousness. That's why in 1 Peter, they, they were born again of the Spirit. The things that were given to them, repent and be baptized. They're one of your names, Jesus Christ, for remission of sins. And you should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
water and spirit. That's not ours. Why? We're in Christ. We're his body. We're already in the resurrection because we're in the resurrection. We're complete and we're a created new creature, holy and without blame before him in love. And nothing, nothing can stop that and nothing can separate us from it. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jerry. Man, thank you, Jerry. Amen, brother Jerry. Lord, yeah. huh? God wrote it. And Jerry, that was great.